Hello, everyone, and welcome to another of our continuing studies in the book of Psalms. Today, we tackle Psalm 135. And uh, as we get close to the last Psalm in this book, Psalm 150, um, we're really amazed at how much information has been provided to us in the Psalms. And it seems like more and more, the Psalms not only cover some uh, personal devotion, which most people associate with the book of Psalms, but it's uh, very good for helping us to understand the past, very good for helping us certainly to understand the present, to also look at that personal application as well as the prophetic application. So before we get into the scripture itself, let's lay down a foundation of prayer and go to our Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day, Lord. We thank you for your continuing gifts and blessings to us. We thank you for the start of uh, sessions uh, like this for the course of 2022. And we thank you, Lord, that uh, you are our God, that you're in charge of all the details, that nothing, nothing, nothing surprises you. And thank you, Father, for watching over us, keeping us safe, keeping us healthy, and allowing us to continue living in your creation and benefiting from it and enjoying it. We just ask that your Holy Spirit would be guiding us today as we take a look at your scriptures and understand here what we uh, see through the agency of the Holy Spirit. So, Father, we just lift this time to you, commit it to you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our risen Lord and Spirit, our risen Lord and Savior, I should say. Amen and amen. So, we are, as I said, in Psalm 135, and there's a lot of interesting questions there, but don't miss for a second that these scriptures written thousands of years ago are incredibly relevant, incredibly relevant for our day and time. So let's get into the, the beginning of this psalm. Let's take a look at a couple of the structural, structural issues. So this particular psalm, if you recall, uh, prior to our brief break, we were studying the Songs of Ascents, and we went through all of those Psalms of Ascents, and now we are beginning a brand new group of Psalms. And this particular group of Psalms is called the Hallelujah Psalms, not the Hallel, but the Hallelujah Psalms. And this particular Psalm is also classified in some Davidic Psalms of Praise. And so, as we see from a structural standpoint, Psalm 135 begins with praise the Lord or praise ye the Lord four times that's done, and then blessed be the Lord four times. In fact, it's interesting the number four is the number of what? The number of nature, the number of creation. And so as we look at that number, we realize that this psalm is likely tied to nature and creation. And so we should be alert for the statements that are made that give us some insight about nature and creation. Now, this particular psalm was written to the priests and the Levites, and it may have been used to dedicate the second temple. So there's some uh, scholarship out there that suggests that uh, perhaps the second temple, that was the temple that was rebuilt after the Babylonian exile, that that temple may have been, um, uh, this not only could have been written, but it could have been dedicated and almost certainly was used to dedicate the second temple. So as we take a look at the the uh, scripture here, we see beginning in uh, verse one, praise ye the Lord, praise ye the name of the Lord, praise him, O servants of the Lord, ye that stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God, praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praises unto his name, for it is pleasant. For the Lord hath chosen Jacob unto himself and Israel for his particular or peculiar treasure. So in verse one, we have three different praises. And so if you take a look here at the inset that is the Greek or Hebrew, in this case, translation, it's the inner linear Bible. And so I pull this up occasionally. Remember that Hebrew is read from right to left. And so when we look at the first praise the Lord, 
we see praise ye the Lord in English, but in the Hebrew, it's halu yah, halu yah. Now the yah is short for Yehovah, the God who makes and keeps his promises. So the first Lord here rendered yah, it's halu yah, which is the word you and I use as hallelujah or alleluia, alleluia in the Greek, hallelujah in the Hebrew. And so we look at that, and it should catch our attention immediately. Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah. The first praise ye the Lord is actually the opening words and the closing words of this particular psalm. And it introduces the, the particular theme of the psalm, which is hallelujah, or praising the Lord. So that's why this particular study is entitled, Sing a Song of Praise to the Lord. Now, praise ye the name of the Lord, which is the second hallelujah or hallu, is to praise his character. When you praise someone's name, you praise their character because in Eastern cultures, including the Hebrew culture, one's name was indicative of one's character. And the, the third praise the Lord points to the relationship that they have with him because it says praise him, praise him. Now, the him is, as you see in the brown box above, the tan box above, the hymn is inferred. Whenever you see a 9999 and no Hebrew um, symbol letter being uh, given, you realize that that particular uh, word has been added by translators to make the readability a bit, a bit easier. So we're, we're, it's, it's pretty straightforward right in the very beginning. So we now want to take a look at verses 2 and 3. And verse 2 reads, Ye that stand in the house of the Lord in the courts of our God. Well, who are the people that stand in the house of the Lord? Well, first of all, we know that in Israel, only the priests and Levites were permitted to stand in the compound itself in the tabernacle and to enter into the inner court of the temple after it was built. So both of these indicate that this is, these are professional Levites, if you will. Their profession is to lead worship, to be officiating in worship, to serve in the temple, whether you're lighting the menorah or whether you're uh, cleansing vessels, you still are a consecrated people group. And so Ye that stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God, praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. This is why we praise him. He's good. Sing praises unto his name, his character, for it is pleasant. And it absolutely is. You know, many of us, when we are dealing with a difficult situation and we don't know quite what to do and we start praising God, all of a sudden our spirits are lifted. That's by our architecture and design. And so verses two and three focus on the corporate worship, which is being led at this particular time by the priests and the Levites who are serving him in all sorts of capacities in the temple. So the person who is cleansing the vessels or toting uh, material for uh, to be burned on the altar, the brazen altar, they're worshiping the Lord by serving him. And this is an important element for us to see. You know, sometimes we think, well, how are we praising the Lord? We are praising the Lord as we serve him, as we carry out the particular ministries to which he's called us. If we're witnessing and we're sharing our faith, yes, we are praising the Lord. When we are working on a Bible study that we're going to present to our children or grandchildren, we are praising the Lord. So all of these things are part of praising the Lord. And then we get to verse 4. For the Lord hath chosen Jacob unto himself and Israel for his peculiar treasure. Well, why Jacob and Israel? Aren't they the same person, just two different names for the same person? Well, this is first we have to look at this. There's this critical tru truth. God always initiated the relationship. You know, when you were a sinner and far off, God initiated the relationship. And he does so because he's good. And so when you look at the Hebrew structure, the praise the Lord for the Lord is good establishes the condition 
under which the Lord has chosen Jacob unto himself and Israel for his peculiar treasure. He does, he chooses both because the Lord is good. Remember, Jesus said, you didn't chose me, but I chose you and that you should go and bear fruit. You can find this throughout the entire New Testament. Uh, Romans 9.18 is probably the most uh, obvious place to look, the most direct quote there. Uh, the name Jacob, by the way, is idiomatic of the nation and or individuals in the nation who are walking by the flesh. Remember that God renamed Jacob after the incident of wrestling with him all night and called him Israel. So Jacob, whenever he's referred to as Jacob, he's walking in the in, in, in the flesh, just like, you know, body, soul, and, and senses Jacob. Um, but naming him Israel is idiomatic of both the nation and or individuals in the nation walking in faith. And so these two names, whenever used in the same sentence, carry the connotation, just as we have to look at the word Lord, Yehovah, the God who makes and keeps promises. Now his renaming of Jacob and Israel help us to understand that God has chosen both the person who's walking in the flesh as well as the person who's walking with God. And this is a very important point for us to understand. Now, this issue of peculiar treasure, well, what does that mean? What does peculiar treasure mean? Well, it means a closely secured or guarded special wealth, a closely secured, something that you are really attempting to secure it because it is that precious to you. Well, this is how God feels about Israel when Israel's walking in faith. Now, I looked at what Alfred Barnes had to say, and I actually copied this from his commentary. The word here rendered treasure means that which is acquired, its property, its wealth. They were what God possessed or owned or claimed among all the peoples of the earth as especially his own. God chose them. God redeemed them. God made them his own. And God regarded them with the interest with which anyone looks on something that he owns, the fruit of his toil. This is what God labored for to acquire these special people. So God has a regard for the nation of Israel as his special people. Now, God loves both the sinner and the saint, Jacob and Israel, because they're chosen as his particular or peculiar treasure. Romans 5, 8, 9 says, but God demonstrates his own love towards us that while we were still sinners, hello, all of us were sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for you when you were a sinner. When did Christ die? Well, chronologically, he died about 2,000 years ago. Uh, were you a sinner 2,000 years ago? God knew you would be. You weren't born yet. And so, by the way, if you were born, um, I'd like to talk to you because I've really had an interest in history. But I don't think anyone here would make that claim. But God knew you intimately before you were born. And then verse 9 goes on to say, much more than being chosen, having now been justified by his blood, what, what Jesus Christ did for you and me, we shall be re saved from wrath, that wrath that comes upon people that reject Christ as their Savior. We are saved from wrath through Jesus Christ. So, when you take a look at this and you're saying, but hold on a second, when this psalm was written, Jesus Christ wasn't yet born. Well, God knew he would be born. God chose the time and the place. God, this is why there are no such things as coincidences or chance happening. God knows everything. And because he knows everything, he arranges things and specifically he arranged for Jesus Christ to be born when Jesus Christ was born. And so he redeemed the nation of Israel in advance by choosing them for himself as a peculiar treasure a thousand years before he made available the method by which all peoples could be redeemed to God, justified because of Jesus Christ. So how did they get justified when they were a thousand years before Jesus Christ? They believed God for God's promises to provide a savior. So all along in the Old Testament and the New Testament, we all got saved the same way. We believed God. 
And by the way, you remember, you all remember that passage that says Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him as righteousness. And so we we realize that God was very aware of the sin that you and I make. In fact, he's not surprised by it. In fact, it's not that you're going to surprise him suddenly this coming Tuesday when you decide deliberately and overtly to sin or you have a lapse of judgment and you sin or be or that you without thinking sin. The fact is he's not surprised because he already knows it. Continuing on, verse 5, for I know, there's the operative word, I know that the Lord is great and that our God is above all gods. Whatsoever the Lord pleads this, that Did he in heaven and in earth, in the seas and all the deep places? He causeth the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He maketh lightnings for the rain. He bringeth the wind out of his treasuries. So the psalmist here is demonstrating how God is superior to all other gods. In verse verse 5, that our Lord is above all gods. He's demonstrating that by what he says then in the following verses. So, Again, let's make sure that we understand some of the Hebrew nuances here. In Hebrew, names reflect a person's character. So in this particular passage, there are several Hebrew names, and they're both rendered Lord, and they're both translated in English Lord. So if you take a look again at the passage, you see that the Lord, right in the middle, Jehovah, the Lord Adoni, Adonu rather, which is a different word than Jehovah. It's Adonai. Both of these reflect God's characters. And there's a reason why he chose them. Here's the first one on your screen. And Jehovah is the God who makes and keeps his promises. So this means that every bit of trust that we have in him, we're never going to be disappointed. You know, how many how many things did you get for Christmas that looked great on the box? And then you opened up the box and Oh, oh, okay. So, but we're never disappointed when we unwrap the present that he gave us and continue to unwrap the present that he gave us all those years ago as we grow and understand what the Lord means and we understand his word. We're never disappointed. We never come away saying, well, that was a non event. No, we come away by being thrilled by what we've learned. Now, the second one here, uh, wa a adenu, is really a compounding. You see the words up in English, and that our Lord. And so the word for Lord here is Adonai. Adonai is almighty and all powerful, Lord and master of all. You see, he's the one who commands all the resources of heaven. He not only created everything, but he commands everything and it must obey his voice. So then we get to this last word, and most of us are used to seeing Elohim as a capitalized E. It is not here. This Elohim is specifically not capitalized, and these are worthless idols whom pagans believe in, the small case E. Idols that are made of stone and wood and metal and imagination, They could do nothing because they are nothing. The fact is that the all-powerful God, the God who makes and keeps promises, is set in direct contrast in this verse to worthless idols. We talk a lot about worthless idols here. So then we see that it says, I know that the Lord is great and our Lord is above all gods. Well, what does that mean? The word great or gadawal means exceedingly great, far, mighty, high, above, or more than. It's a comparative term that's coupled with above all. The word there is kol, K-O-L. That word is the whole, all, any and all, everyone, every place, everything. So the Hebrew sentence here is very, very emphatic. There's no doubt about it. The Lord is great that our Lord is above all gods, above all gods. And so This is our Lord's declaration that Jehovah, Adonai, are quite superior to anything and everything and collectively all that has ever been called small g, God. Well, 
continuing the question, how does the psalmist show God to be superior to all gods? He tells us here in verse six, whatsoever the Lord pleased, whatever he pleased, that did he in heaven, in earth, in the seas, and all the deep places. He did whatever he wanted to do. So when we look around and say, well, why is this this way? Because he wanted it to be that way. Because it is. And that's one of those cases where you can look at God and say, God directs this as the creator, always directs everything of his creation. And so the whatsoever the Lord pleased, that did he anything he wanted to do with or within his creation, he did. He has that control. Remember, he spoke it into an existence. If he wanted to, sp to speak everything to turn the color pink, he could choose to do so. He doesn't choose to do so. The point is, he has complete power and control. Now, we see this, this uh, passage, deep places, and we look at that. This is one word in Hebrew, to haom. It means subterranean places, but not just under the earth's surface, the land. It's also under the earth's water surface. And so the deep places can be anything that's below the surface. That's, that's the connotation of it. God simply, as I said, spoke all the aspects of creation into existence. Remember, when you go back to Genesis 1, it says that, they, that God created. The word bara means to create out of nothing. He just thought it and created it, said, let there be light. There was light. Let there be this. Let there be that. It just was created, the original creation. So he spoke it into existence. Now, one of the things that's always fascinated me, if humans were made in the likeness of God and we speak, well, if God spoke and he created everything just by simply speaking it, will you and I look at that effort? How much effort is it to speak it? For us, it's usually the doing of it's the difficult part. But for God, he simply spoke it into existence. Maybe this tells us that maybe the words that we have are more powerful than we think they are, but that'll be a discussion for another day. Now we see in verse seven, he, God, causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. Well, what does that mean? He, and, and notice here, he causeth the vapors, he maketh lightnings, he bringeth the wind. All of these are statements about the absolute control that God has over his creation. Now, it's interesting that this verse, verse 7, is a technologically advanced verse because man didn't even have a clue when this was written that these things were actually occurring and didn't understand anything about the creation in terms of what are we talking about here? We're talking about weather. And this is very, very interesting. God created and enabled the sun's rays to evaporate water everywhere. The vapors riseth to form clouds of water vapor. So what does he do? He makes lightnings for the rain. Lightning generally accomplishes a heavy rainstorm is generally has lightning involved. Now, the lightning may be close to the surface of the earth. It may be very, very high into the atmosphere, but that's typically what happens. And that lightning associated with the rainstorms, it's the rainstorms itself that deposit rain across the planet. Water evaporates from bodies of water, it rises into the air, it blows across the surface of the land, stops at certain spots that God wants it to rain, and then allows the rain to occur. And then he says this, this further statement, he bringeth the wind out of his treasuries. He has this vast treasury, this capacity to generate winds. And so he created the global wind currents that move storms and clouds and direct every single drop of rain to where he desires it to fall. If you're walking outside and it's raining, one drops on your head, yeah, God meant it, that drop to go directly on your head. And yeah, he meant the drop that missed you to miss you. It's not happenstance. It's not just random stuff. And that's the, that, that's the issue that God is trying to talk about here, saying, look, I am great. I'm above all other gods. This is God speaking. God says that he is so far above all the other gods. And he demonstrates this by complete and utter control over the things that he permits to happen. Now, you and I look at a diagram like this, done with 21st century accuracy. I mean, 
who knows that open to land atmospheric flux is 0.56%. We know that today because we can measure such thing. Did you realize that water in the atmosphere distributed across the planet is 0.0009%? I didn't. But when you look at this, you realize that God in his scripture 2,500 plus years ago, you know, he, insta he, he initiated this model following the flood of Noah 5,600 years ago and 2,500 years ago. In other words, 3,000 years lapses, and then he wrote to us about it so that we could understand it. And yet, here we go with this weather. You know, we look at this diagram, and I would command you to come back and retrieve the recording of this from uh, uh, churchlh.com slash TV. Scroll down, look at more of Psalms, click on that, find this particular Psalm 135. This is a great diagram to take a look at. But here's some interesting information. The hydrological model, that of the rain evaporating, the water system, how water moves through the planet, was initially proposed in 350 BC by Aristotle. In other words, it was proposed more than 2,000 years after God described it in his scripture. Now, discoveries and hypotheses continued for about 2,000 years after Aristotle proposed this model. Then in the late 16th and 17th century, meteorological instruments were developed. They, had a, they finally had something to tell the temperature and the amount of humidity, the water pressure, the barometer and the hydrometer all were being developed thousands of years after this statement, this technologically complex statement was given to us in scripture. And long after God put this into the 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 uh, effect back prior to you know he, he knew about this prior to the point that he created the planet but it was after the flood of noah that he put this weather system that we you and i see today it's post flood it's a post flood weather system in 1904 yerkness a norwegian speculated that weather could be forecasted now I kind of wonder, because I know I came up in a farming community, grew up in a farming community, you know, we knew when the cows lay down in the meadows, it was going to rain. Well, I'm sure that people sort of speculated, but Yerkness, this Norwegian in, in 1904, speculated that you could actually forecast weather, you know. If you happen to wake up in uh, um, in, in in the eastern uh, northeastern U.S. this morning and you saw the sunrise, you saw what? You saw it red in the sky, and you remember that little bit of dog roll that you and I learned: red in the morning, sailor's warning; red at night, sailor's delight. Well, we saw, we actually saw. But the point is that the formal statement goes back to 1904, and then in the 1950s, the first numerical forecast began. We think it's going to be this hot. We think it's going to be this cold. By the way, how accurate is that? <laughs> I think we, we've had enough experience with weather forecasts to realize that even the best forecasters generally are going to be wrong more than right. But, you know, we follow that and dress accordingly and drive or don't drive accordingly. So what should our response be to all this? This statement here, the Lord is great, the Lord is above all gods, what should our response be to that? Well, we should simply trust him in everything. Every single matter we should be able to trust him in. And he, he doesn't have to answer our questions. Do you know that? He does, there's nowhere that you're going to say, well, I guarantee that I'm going to answer every question you ever have. He doesn't have to rescue us when we, you and I, cause our own trouble, get ourselves in difficulty because we disobey what he says, but guess what he does? He rescues us and he gives us answers. And oftentimes you'll be reading a passage and all of a sudden it will occur to you that what you've been reading all along has contained the answer to one of the questions that you've had over time. One of the great things to do is to journal your questions and then um, come back to it and, and make the entry when God reveals the answer to you, how he revealed the answer to you. It's a pretty amazing thing. He, he's anticipated every single question and the answers in his Bible. He reveals himself to us through his Bible. Every single question we've ever had, 
is already answered there. All the questions to why do people do this and why does this happen, all in the Bible. And the interesting thing here is as the creator, he's invited us to join us in his creation and in his plan. He said, I'd like you to be part of this thing that I've created. By the way, I foreknew you before I started the planet, before I laid out this creation. Well, if he foreknew us before the foundations of the world, how much of the planning for the foundations of the world were considering you and me before he created it? I'll leave you with that one. That's a pretty interesting thing to, to think about. Now, our response should be to trust him, but our response should be also to wholeheartedly praise him for everything he's done. That's what this psalm, psalm is about. We should be praising God for all that he's done. You know, in, in his word are promises, promises, promises. He's kept every single one of those promises. You and I are the beneficiary of all those promises that he's given to us. Remember, here we have five praise the Lord's, four bless the Lord's tell us that our thanks Praise and blessing is to be continual, though multiple praise the Lord's because his blessing is continual. It's not like it's all going to run out next week. No, he's going to continue to bless and bless and bless. That's who our God is. And really important point we can't miss. Man was created to praise God and give him glory. This is our highest purpose, and it's our privilege. It's not that we have to do it. He's not going to force you to do it, but we get to do it. And as we get to do it, we align, align our high heartbeat and our thinking with the creator of the universe. That's what he's invited you and me to participate in. And then the psalm goes on in verse 8, who smote God, talking about God, who smote the firstborn of Egypt, both man and beast, who sent tokens and wonders, signs and wonders in the midst of thee, O Egypt, upon Pharaoh and upon all his servants, who smote the great nations and slew mighty kings. Gives us two examples, Sihon, king of the Amorites, Og, king of Bashan, and all of the kingdoms of Canaan, and gave their land, not their land from an ownership standpoint, the land that they were occupying, for an heritage, and heritage unto Israel and his people. Thy name, O Lord, endures forever. Thy memorial, O Lord, throughout all generations. For the Lord will judge his people, and he will repent himself concerning his servants. Well, why does God list this set of signs and wonders right in the first part of the passage above? Smiting the firstborn of Egypt, etc., etc. Why? Well, this is God, Jehovah, the God that makes and keeps promises. He recites several examples of his past deliverances to Israel. First of all, verse 8 and 9, God was working through Moses and Aaron. He made Egypt, which was then the most mighty nation on the earth, to suffer a series of 10 plagues and literally be defeated. In fact, he wanted it to be a no doubt about it that he continually hardened the heart of Pharaoh to resist letting his people go. And so with all of that buildup of crescendo and all the things that he did, then he says, finally, you're going to let my people go with this last plague, which is the firstborn of Egypt, cited directly here. And he's reminding everyone that he's God and they are not. And the fact is that any deliverance that God has ever had of you or me or the Jews historically has been because of God, not us. We can't credit it to ourselves. That would be trying to take God's position for ourselves. Then verse 10 to 13, smote great nations, slew mighty kings, gives us an example of Sihon and uh, Og, uh, gave their land for an heritage, a heritage unto his people. Thy name, O Lord, endures forever, and thy memorial, O Lord, through all generations. Well, God defeated both human and superhuman kings who stood against his people, Israel, preventing them from entering the promised land. So from Moses to David, God defeated more than a dozen nations that wanted to keep Israel from God's promised land. Sihon and Og were both Nephilim kings. You can read all about the Nephilim beginning in Genesis chapter 6. These are angel-human hybrids that possess not only superhuman strength, but superhuman 
size. Goliath and his five brothers were all Nephilim. And so we, we need to understand that. Whatever the enemy, though, God always provided both the means to the victory as well as the victory him, itself. And because he has done this, his name endures as it should. You know, we sit and we remember historical events by the name we put on those historical events. Well, God's continually delivering Israel. So his name endures because he's the agency by which that uh, deliverance took place. Israel was given the promised land on condition of obedience. You should read Deuteronomy 28. It outlines everything. If you do this, then I'm going to do this. If you do that, I'm going to do that. And all of it's laid out for you in Deuteronomy 28. God's faithfulness to keep his promises stands in stark contrast to the fact that man conditionally, collectively, and throughout all history, including the leaders, have been unfaithful. That's why you use the name Jacob, because it, don't, it, it denotes the fact that, that Israel is unfaithful at that time. So the unfaithfulness of people, of us, and the unfaithfulness of leaders always is in contrast to God who never lies, never tells a mistruth, always does what he says he's going to do. So what happens when peoples and nations mess around with Israel's right to the land? It says here that he gave, God gave their land for an heritage, a heritage unto his people Israel. Specific, pretty specific. We look at a bunch of places, by the way, where this says this is true. And so you see events like you see here in the picture. And, you know, I'm sure the two young ladies there that are screaming at the top of their lungs and, you know, I do not recognize Israel. Well, guess what? doesn't matter whether you recognize it. Israel is who God says he would be. And what, so why do people do this? Well, the people do this because they are essentially asserting that they have a higher standing than God. Let me say that again. People assert their higher standing that they think they have, making them higher than God. I'm mightier than God. That's what the person is saying. Remember, it's his land. His land. He created it. It's his land. He owns it all. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He gave it to Israel to possess as their inheritance. You read all about that in Genesis 12 and 15 and a whole bunch of other places. Those who defy God in this way absolutely accrue some pretty horrible consequences, both in this life as well as eternally. You see, they go to their grave and they're continuing to assert themselves against God. God has no choice to give them what they want. They want nothing to do with God. Guess what? They get separated from God permanently. Verse 14 says, for the Lord will judge his people and he will repent himself concerning his servants. Well, this word repent, by the way, I've given you the English and the, um, the Hebrew word. Does God actually repent of something that he does? Well, we need to understand this. The English says he will repent himself. The uh, Hebrew word um, in English lettering is yitenham, yitenaham rather, but the root is naham, which means to ease or relent. It's like we're backing off of a position. So here, the word is not in the sense of repent, like you and I would repent for, of our sin, feel bad about it, say we don't want to do this, um, Lord. We just don't want to be a part of that. Nacham means to choose to stop. God chose to back off. God chose to stop. Now notice what it says here in verse 14. For the Lord God will judge his people. Well, what does he judge his people for? He judges his people for what they have earned or deserved. All you need to do is read Deuteronomy 28 to understand all the things that God says will happen if the Jews fail not to be obedient to him while they're in the land. So this issue of judging, but then it says he chose to back off of that judging. That's what it means here. For the Lord will judge his people and he'll choose to back off concerning his servants. Ah, ha, ha, ha. Conserving his, concerning his servants. 
God loves his servants. Even when they sin, it causes him pain. So his long-suffering nature says, I can't ignore this, but I'm going to give the sinner ample time to confess and repent of their sins and seek my forgiveness. That's what God says that he does for his sinners. That's what he does. And so we have ample time to back off. If we choose not to do so, we choose to continue in his sin, we suffer consequences. God doesn't want to judge us. That's not, he takes no joy, no pleasure in judging. He just wants to bless us. But when we insist on having our own way and being our own God, he has no choice. In other words, we get what we are forcing God to do. Remember what Jesus Christ accomplished. He paid the price for every human being ever born once and for all time and made it available to have forgiveness and reconciliation with God. So how do people in the Old Testament get saved? By believing the same thing you and I did, that God was going to provide a way, that God said he would and he would do it and he did it. And so when that way was made manifest, made flesh, 2,000 years ago, they, we now could see this person, Jesus, and see his earthly years and see what he accomplished. And now we have witnesses of him in the word of God and by the mouth of the witnesses that actually witnessed Jesus Christ's human phase here on the planet. Remember, we have this opportunity. God doesn't want to judge. That's not what he wants to do. He chooses to back off concerning his servants. Well, what do servants do? They obey the master. This is it's pretty clear when you look at it in this light. The idols of the heathen are silver and gold, the work of men's hand. They have mouths, but they don't speak. They have eyes, they don't see. They have ears, they don't hear. Neither is their breath in their mouths. They that make them are like unto them. Those that make idols are like the idols, and so is everyone that trusts in the idols. So how do you describe somebody that trusts in idols? Well, first of all, God's pretty direct that it says here that idol makers and those that trust in idols take on the same characteristic as the idol. They can't think, they can't see, they can't speak, can't hear, they rely on someone to carry them around. They're at best ornamentation. They're at best just useless ornamentation. God says those who choose to follow idols are trusting are, and declaring them to be God when he, God, is manifest, abundantly manifest around them. Guess what? They're pretty, pretty stupid because the idols don't think. The idols don't see. The idols don't hear. Therefore, the people who trust in the idols don't think. They don't see. They don't hear. That's what he's saying. Psalm 115 that we studied in um, other uh, weeks here, and you can go ahead and check it, uh, churchlh.com slash TV, and scroll down to the Psalm section, hit the button more of Psalms, and you can go ahead and take a look at and listen to and watch that video recording of Psalm 115. Almost identical words, by the way. You see, the same is true, it hasn't changed since these words were written 3,000 years ago, 3,500 years ago, idols delude and deceive. They make the person who trusts in them a fool. Bottom line is a person who worships an idol becomes like the idols they worship. Pretty simple. So you have a picture over here to the left, and you see a whole bunch of um, household idols, little scriptures and statuettes all representing a variety of idols of probably more than one culture. So if they were anything other than fake gods, now think about this for a second. What would happen to them if they were arranged all on the, the shelf? Well, I can imagine they would be at war because whoever has the top shelf probably is the top idol, right? So they'd be having a little bit of disagreement with them. In fact, are they gonna stay organized on the shelf? I mean, obviously they were put in an order, by whoever put them there, but they don't want to be, you know, the, the, some of them are pretty jealous of the ones next to them, so they don't want to be there. They want to worry, they would, if they were any kind of gods, they would, of course, be able to arrange themselves or jump off the shelf or go to another place on the wall. 
They'd fight over who got the choices spots, how much space each one deserved or required. Well, you got to be at least three inches from me. No, I want four inches. No, I want five inches. You can imagine how much bickering they would be going on back and forth as they argue amongst themselves if they were anything other than some hunk of material, inanimate, useless, just dumb material. There would be bitter rivalries. You know, you would imagine if you think about it, if they really had power, then that whole building would be damaged. They would be damaging the whole area around them. Of course they don't do that because it's silly, silly, silly to put your faith and trust in a hunk of metal or wood or ceramic. And I love this. Uh, Isaiah 44 passage that's very much fun in the same manner that the questions that I, uh, the points I just made were sort of somewhat fun. Those who make an image, all of them are useless. Who's useless? Those who make an image. And their precious things shall not profit. They're their own witnesses. They, the people are witnessing of who they are by making these things. They shall neither see nor know that they may be ashamed. Who would form a god or mold an image that profits him nothing? Surely all of his companions would be ashamed. And the workmen, they are mere men. Let them all be gathered together. Let them stand up. Yet they shall fear and be ashamed together. The blacksmith with tongues of the works, one in the coals, fashions it with hammers, works it with the strength of his arms. Even so, he's hungry. His strength fails. He drinks and <laughs> no water and is faint. The craftsman stretches out his rule, marks one out with chalk, fashions it with a plane, marks it out with a compass, makes it like the figure of a man, according to the beauty of man, that it may remain in the house. This is talking about making the idols. Well, it's a pretty interesting thing. Idols are useless. Idols are useless. There's no profit in them. It's a waste of time and resources. They serve as a witness to the uselessness of their makers, and they should be ashamed. Having these things and displaying them should make us ashamed, but they're not. So who's foolish enough to work at useful uselessness, rather, is the, the point of, of, of uh, verse 10. Who would be foolish enough to do that? It's, it's a, a totally useless. Why would you do that? It's like, well, I'm putting paint on the side of the trees that grow in the woods that nobody's going to see. Why? Well, I don't know. I'm just doing it. Why? that's useless. If an idol maker's companions thought about how useless their idol making friends were, they'd be ashamed. They wouldn't want to hang out with this person anymore because companions of fools become fools themselves. We know that. So if the God, the idol maker is making was actually powerful, then the idol maker would get stronger, not weaker as he's making the idols, right? But just the opposite happens. He gets pooped, tuckered, thirsty, tired, beat. So much for the idol. The idol maker uses skills, capabilities, and artistic talents to make the idols. Who gave him those capabilities? The one true God did. The one true God designed him as an amazing creation, as we've seen in some of our recent studies. And yet they stop and think, oh, God, make this hunk of wood into an idol. Oh, oh, oh. The block of wood, the block of metal is unable to do anything on its own, doesn't sit there and create itself. It has to be subject to what its maker does. And yet the maker made it now is supposed to say this God is more powerful than I am, more capable than I am. This passage of Isaiah continues. It, it's, it's funny. He cuts down cedars for himself, takes all the cypress in the earth, oak and secures it him, for himself among the trees of the forest. He plants a, a pine, the rain nourishes it. Then it shall be for a man to burn that'll take some of it and warm himself. Yes, he kindles it, makes bread, indeed makes a god and worships it, makes a carved image and falls down to it. He burns half of it in the fire. With this half, he eats meat and roast to roast and is satisfied. He warms himself, says, oh, I'm warm, I've seen the fire. And the rest of it, he makes into a god, his carved image. He falls down before it, worships it, prays to it, says, deliver me for you're my god. Again, such, such stupidness, such silliness. Idol makers have to go out into a forest, find a tree to cut it down for the wood to make the idol. Well, if the god was all powerful, wouldn't it make itself? But it's not. The god behind the idol didn't plant the tree, didn't send the rain, doesn't say that here. It says that 
The guy probably planted some of the trees, other trees God planted, but God waters them all. Man doesn't create the rain. God Almighty does. You see, this is such an important point. When we read this, we miss this point that Psalm 135 is trying to point out. When, he, when the psalmist points out the hydrological the weather cycle earlier in the psalm. It wasn't man that made that. Heck, man could man was ignorant of it for thousands of years. And when he finally realized, duh, there's something going on out there. Duh, what's that thing falling on my head? And they try to go ahead and explain it. Guess what? They can't. And it has taken them thousands of years to come up with systematic processes to try to explain something that God put into existence and operations thousands and thousands of years before. You see, when the idol maker uses some of the tree for, for, for fuel, how does he know which part to use as a god? Does the wood talk to him? Does the wood come up and say, maybe change color and say, well, I, I'm for the god part, and then you can bake your bread on the other part. I'll let you do that. No. He chooses, he chooses. The maker, the one who makes it, chooses what part to use. And then falls down and worships it. Now think about that. It's just... It really is foolishness. So ask yourself, what would happen? What if he ha happens to choose the wrong piece of wood to eat and cook with? He's burning up the god, but he doesn't think about this as he sits there and warms his hands over the fire and says, "This is a pretty good meal." After he carves the the god from the remainder of wood, he expects the god to deliver him from his difficulties, and it continues. Isaiah 8, uh, 44, 18 to 20. They do not know nor understand, for he, God, has shut their eyes so that they cannot see, and their hearts so that they cannot understand. God has shut their eyes and their hearts. And nobody considers in his heart, nor is there any knowledge of understanding, to say, I've burned half of it in the fire, yet I've baked bread on it, I've roasted meat and eaten it, and shall I make the rest of it for an abomination to God? Shall I fall down before a block of wood? Huh. This person feeds on ashes, on nothing, on burn up nothing. Deceitful heart has turned him aside. He cannot deliver his soul nor say, is there not a lie in my right hand, that thing that I just made? You see, verse 18 says, how can idol makers and those who worship them be so blind as to what they do? God has as he declared in Romans 121, cause thinking to lead to darkened mind and futile thinking. So our idol maker there is the duh. It doesn't get it. Just doesn't, doesn't, doesn't get it. Those who make idols and worship them have become so self-deluded that they can't, won't. That word there, quote, they cannot, won't see the obvious. They deliberately blind themselves to the obvious. They're thinking of self-impaired. They can't even perform simple reasoning because their ability to have rationality escapes them when they go down this path. What might have been a bright person is now reduced to the brains of a block of wood. That's what, in essence, this passage in Isaiah says. That person, nor their idol, can save their soul. So ultimately, they made a choice to spend their eternity in Gehenna hell. By the way, we're going to have some discussion about Gehenna hell in some future sessions. Remember Psalm 115, almost identical to 135. They that make idols are like them, like unto them, and so is everyone that trusts in them. So let's finish off this particular psalm. It says, bless the Lord, O house of Israel. Bless the Lord, O house of Aaron. Bless the Lord, O house of Levi. Ye that fear the Lord, bless the Lord. Blessed be the Lord out of Zion, which dwelleth at Jerusalem. Praise ye the Lord. So Israel is the nation, while the houses of Aaron and Levi are the families that served in the tabernacle, the priests and the Levites. And we see some examples of what priests and Levites, their serving garb was. So what distinction did Israel have for many of the years from its birth to Exodus, uh, in the Exodus rather, until Christ's departure versus other countries? So they were God's special people, but what did they what did they have going on in, in the nation that was an advantage for them to be able to see so that they wouldn't fall into idolatry, but they did. 
what advantages did they have? Well, first of all, their God was present with them. It is Emmanuel, God with us, that name, Emmanuel, God with us. God was with them. You remember that God was with them when they were running out of Egypt? He was with them in the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. That cloud by day and pillar of fire by night is the Shekinah glory that hung over them all the years of their wilderness wanderings. Every single day, his presence was there. The Shekinah glory filled the temple or the tabernacle and later the temple. God said that he met with the people of Israel, the leaders of Israel, between the cherubim of the mercy seat. We talked about that in the previous session. So God was with them. And then he dwelt with them for 33 years. He was born of the virgin, fulfilling Genesis 3's prophecies, and that Jesus paid the price for their sins and ascended unto heaven since AD 32. So the nation had their God with them in some form or manifestation all the time even when God was with them. Some of us have said in our past, well, you know, if God would only come right down and show me, if Jesus Christ would appear to me, if I'd be yanked up into heaven, I'd have us an audience. Guess what? They were with him for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. God was with them and they didn't see. They chose, they quote see. So we have this passage, bless the Lord, O house of Israel, bless the Lord, O house of Aaron, bless the Lord, O house of Levi, ye that fear the Lord, bless the Lord. Blessed be the Lord out of Zion, or Jerusalem, which dwelleth at Jerusalem. The God dwells at Jerusalem. Praise ye the Lord. Why are they a fitting conclusion? Well, first of all, all who fear the Lord, the nation, the nation walking in faith, priests and Levites, they're instructed multiple times here to praise God. It's a continual praise. God, in turn, blesses them because of the special relationship he and they have. That relationship doesn't know any limits. It isn't limited to a certain amount of time. It isn't limited to, I'm going to forgive you this number of times, and then I'm going to do this. I'm going to send rain on, on you for X number of hours before I'm not going to send that anymore. No. He continues to bless and bless and bless and bless and bless, whether people are worshiping him or not, because his blessings like the rain, his blessing like the sun, his blessing, blessings like the seasons, his blessings like the plants that grow food and animals that produce food, all of those blessings come from God on the righteous and unrighteous, both. God has always greatly desired the personal relationship and fellowship with the people that he created and cared for. Remember, he created man to worship him, to have a relationship with him. And you know, most of us in our own humanness cannot understand this. And we have people in our lives that are abusive, are absolutely criminal towards us. They despise us. They tell us that every moment in time. They seek to do our harm, us harm. What do we do? We distance ourselves. What does God do? Continues to love, continues to be long suffering, continues to reach out, continues to say, I'm giving you another chance until one day it's too late and that person dies and there is no other chance. You see, this intimate praise and blessing relationship is unique in history. It's apart from religion. Remember, religion is nothing more than man trying to have a system to bind himself to God, to get himself up to God. That's why the Tower of Babel was religion, because it attempted to build a tower to God to get up there. You see, this praise and blessing relationship is very unique. When you praise God, you, can, you invite his continued blessings. You bring on yourself the blessings that come from identifying with the God that you worship. You see, man attempts all sorts of things, including Satan-centered idol worship. All idol worship is Satan-centered because it's worshiping something other than God. And God says, I am number one on a list of one. When we see this and we see these words and 
oftentimes we're prone to run past the words and look at them and read them and say, okay, yeah, 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 on to the next one. I've only got five more minutes left. You know, that type of thing. We stop. We really do need to stop and consider the implications. And Psalm 135 is an incredible set of implications for us to understand that we are to praise him because he is God, to praise him because there is no God but him. You see, it leaves us with one conclusion. Why do we praise him? Simply because he loves us. If for no other reason, he loves us. He's demonstrated that a million zillion different ways. So how will you respond to Psalm 135? Is it interesting? Or has it reached your heart to say, hold on a second, when I'm worshiping him, I really need to be thinking about what I'm doing here. Not mouthing the words to the song, but understanding and processing the words to the song. Really, 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 really understanding that your Lord, your God, who ransomed you, who saved you, has saved you to a glorious future. That's what our God is all about. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the truth of these words. We thank you, Lord, that you and you alone are God, that there is no other God, that anything that we think is God is not, and that you and you alone stand solitary in a class of one as God. You are God. And Lord, you have blessed us beyond measure. You've invited us into this beautiful creation of yours. You've given us things that we take for granted, like air to breathe, like a heart that beats by itself without us having to do something. You have given us such, such, such blessing. Each and every day, you find a million different ways to bless us. Father, thank you for who you are, for all that you have done, all that you are currently doing, Lord, and all that you will do. We know, Lord, that you created us to be eternal beings. And so after we have said goodbye to this planet as our temporary residence and to this body as our temporary residence, Lord, we know that we will be with you in eternity, not because we deserve it, but because you paid the price for it. Father, our heart is overwhelmed by all that you have done, all the ways that you bless us each and every day. And just the futile thinking that comes from thinking that we had something to do with that. We didn't. That's sin, Father. We confess it. We repent of it. We seek your truth. We seek your face. We seek that intimate relationship with you. One day, Lord, you promise us we will see you face to face. Oh, what a glorious day that will be. Until then, you tell us, Father, that we are to occupy until you return. So occupy we do, Father, and through the agency of your word, we can come to a better understanding of what we need to be doing until that time comes. As the psalmist says, and so do we, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. All people praise the Lord. God's people say, amen.